Well, good afternoon. It's two o'clock here, so we'll get started. Um, we're very lucky today to have Don Gustafson here to talk about pollinators in, in gardening. Um, I, he inspired me last year um, when I first met him, when we started the Door County Seed Library, he was on the, he's on the planning team and he had um, a talk at his own garden here in Sturgeon Bay and it was spectacular. He gave away some seeds, which I've planted and have grown this year. So um, I think he'll inspire some of the rest of you to plant more pollinating plants in your garden. Um, Don is not only a member of the planning team for the Door County Seed Library, he's also um, a member of the Wild Ones of Door County, of the Door Peninsula, and that group focuses on native plants. So I'd like to get started, and Don, do you want to take it away? Let me share your, the slides with everyone. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining in. And what Laura said, I want to uh, reinforce that idea that my primary purpose here is to encourage others to plant pollinator gardens. But before I do that, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, the people that have helped me do this presentation. And that is Laura Kayakin for her technical support. And uh, from the Door County Library and Penny Wilson president of the Door County Seed Library, who helped me with this PowerPoint presentation. And without their help, this would not have happened. And I'm very grateful for that. This Zoom Pollinator Garden presentation is sponsored by the Door County Seed Library and the Wild Ones of Door Peninsula and the help of the Door County Library. So thank you very much. If you love growing plants from seed, vegetables, herbs, flowers, and wildflowers, I would encourage you to become a member of the Door County Seed Library. Also, if you love native plants and pollinators and love pollinator gardens, become a member of Wild Ones of Door Peninsula. You know, I was thinking of the best way to describe myself, and I guess. I would be a self-proclaimed evangelist, an advocate, spreading the gospel, the truth, the word about the importance of pollinator gardens. And at the end, I just wanna remind everybody that we will have a question and answer period at the very end. So from now on, we'll, we'll go into the next slide or next. Why have a pollinator garden? Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Oh. All right. Uh, pollinator <laughs> gardens attract pollinators. Can everybody see the? Yeah. Okay. Why have a pollinator garden? Let us. Let's go to the next slide, then, please. There you go. I think it's self-evident this picture describes is more than I can describe why we should have a pollinator garden. Because pollinator gardens track pollinators, like this tiger swallowtail on a prairie blazing star. But pollinator gardens are not one-dimensional like most gardens. Pollinated gardens are multidimensional. They attract butterflies, moths, bees, beetles, even flies that do pollination, as well as hummingbirds and birds. So we have to think of that multidimensional uh, component. And pollinator gardens are interactive. You can go out to the garden, you can see a hummingbird, you can see a tiger swallowtail, uh, you can see moths, goldfinches, birds. So it's an interactive response with pollinator gardens. However, pollinator gardens are declining at alarming rates due to pesticide and habitat loss. And that is where you can come in. You can plant your 
pollinator garden in your very own backyard. Just as well, just as, as I have done. Next. Okay, this is a picture of my backyard and it's probably midsummer, and you can see a variety of pollinator plants. And I'm gonna go from the left to right and we have Royal Catchfly, we have a Berry Blazing Star, Mountain Mint, you have golden rod, you have yellow cone, yellow uh, cone flowers, uh, button blazing star, bee balm, more royal catch fly. And then in the back, which is kind of neat, we have the tall plants, and that is cup plant, which is great for birds. And it is cup, it you know, holds water, and so birds can get a Get their drink of water. And to the right of that, we have compass plant, and then, then we have prairie dock, which is one of my favorite plants. And in the back, we have my orchard, which these pollinators now are benefiting and pollinating my apple orchard in the back. So you have all this dynamics of the insects and the flowers, and then it it helps pollinate my fruit trees in the backyard. So it's a win-win situation. Okay, next. All right, uh, this certainly is, this also is a picture in my backyard and it's the end of August when they have all the monarch butterflies. And this is on the Meadow Blazing Star, which is your, which is your butterfly magnet. And um, this was taken, we, I usually have a butterfly walk at that time. So if anybody's interested in this butterfly walk, it's always at the end of August. And uh, you can see that there's probably 20 monarch butterflies on the metal blazing star there. So it really truly is a, a magnet. Okay, next. All right. Uh, here we have Royal Catchfly in the foreground. And that's really a good one for um, hummingbirds. And uh, the red is also a nice addition because a lot of the prairie plants are not, there's yellows and purple, but not many reds. And so that's a nice addition to your pollinator garden. Next. Okay, that's a hummingbird, of course, on a royal catch fly. And you can see that the flower is tubular and of course the uh, hummingbird is is uh, getting some pollen there, or so I should say nectar. Next. All right, this is a, a great plant in the fall and there's a great companion plant also with New England aster. And you can see in the foreground that you have bumblebees and you have some beetles and um, that is a very good one. The showy goldenrod is a magnet for bees and beetles. Next. All right, there you can even see some, some uh, monarch butterflies. And this is, in the fall, you can't get a better combination of, of the New England aster and the uh, showy goldenrod because of the the color contrast, and they really do help the, the pollinators in the fall, particularly butterflies as monarchs, as they uh, get the uh, nectar for their fall, fall migration. Thank, next one, please. Okay. What I would encourage you to now is to think about creating a new habitat, 
new pollinator habitat for our declining uh, pollinators. And this is primarily lost result of um, pesticides and habitat loss. So it's important that we can do this in our own backyards by planting these pollinator gardens. Next. Okay, these are some spring flowering plants. This is some I have in my backyard. The first one is pass flower. And that blooms about Easter. It's a very short plant, not very tall. So it's good like if you have a, a rock garden, you want to plant up and plant that one in the in the um, foreground. It's a short plant. And so that's a really good early spring one. Not too easy to grow, however. You really should get plants for that one. To buy plant. And then lupin is a good one. It's a little tall, can be a little aggressive, but it's also a host plant for the Carner blue butterfly. It's an endangered butterfly. And then you have beer tongue. On the right, it's easy to grow from seed and bumblebees like this. Next. Okay, columbine. One of the first plants for to produce nectar, nectar for hummingbirds. And it's a good shade plant. And you got golden Alexander. And that's an important plant for short tongued insects able to reach the nectar. Also, black swallowtail caterpillars feed on its leaves. Next. All right, uh, this is uh, prairie sun drops. It's a very ornamental plant. It's really a very showy plant. It can be a little aggressive. It spreads by rhizomes, so you have to kind of make sure that you keep that plant in check. It is a very ornamental, beautiful plant. And then uh, you have Shooting Star. And that's a real good early one, very ornamental. And uh, that's also a shorter plant, so you can plant that one up front. Next. Okay, bee balm. It tops the pollinator chart list. In fact, those pollinator plants are rated on the number of insects they attract. And that's the number one, number one plant. It attracts all nine, whether it be butterflies, moths, insects, flies, beetles, hummingbirds, it's, it's on the top list. Okay, Black Eyed Susan, I like it because it blooms for so long, like five months. And it, it is a great pollinator plant. Purple Coneflower, easy to grow from, from seed. And it's much loved by bees and butterflies. Goldfinches de devour the seeds. So it's a very good plant. Next. Okay, Anna's Hyssop. It's deer resistant, it's fragrant, easy to grow. And flowers are pollinated by native bees and honeybees alike. And I like it because it's, it's, a, it's a good reseeder. It's even though it's an annual, it reseeds every year. And it's, um, it's a great pollinator plant and the deer don't like it. Uh, Joe Pie Weed, uh, it's, it's a, a very good pollinator, uh, quite a long growing season. It's tall, you want that in the back of your pollinator garden. 
and it attracts a lot of uh, pollinators. And then butterfly weed, um, I like the color, the orange color. And of course it is a host plant for uh, butterflies, monarchs, tiger swallowtail and all kinds of butterflies. Next. Okay, mountain mint. Uh, that's a good one. It's a very um, easy to grow from seed. One of the best natives to attract pollinators. It's got a great smell. And in fact, it's what you want to do is you want to crush this between your fingers and smell it. It's really a, a powerful minty flavor. The next one is partridge bee. It's a, also an annual, but it reseeds very easily. So it can, what I like about it, it can grow around your garden, not just in one spot. And when other things aren't blooming, this has a long blooming period. And it is a legume, so it adds nitrogen to your soil. Partridge pea. And then I think no pollinator garden can be without prairie dock uh, with its large elephant like size leaves and um, it also is a very good pollinator to attract lots of different uh, uh, bees and wasps and butterflies moss and so forth okay next Okay, uh, there again is Royal Catchfly, and that's a good one for hummingbirds. We've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, it's red, which is good. Uh, cup plant, we talked about that. It's a good one for goldfinches, and also um, it, it, uh, it has a cup, and, and uh, there's water that go in there, and then it, 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 it gives water to birds. And then rose milkweed is a real good one for your um, monarchs and butterflies. As you can see the caterpillars on there. I think that's one, probably the one plant that I have, that I find the most ca uh, monarch caterpillars. Okay, next. Um, this is a, this, this is called cardinal flower. It it's, uh, grows in kind of a wet, like wet feet and shade. And I have this in my uh, pollinator garden and it really attracts the hummingbirds. And it's very colorful. You got to have a little bit of shade for it, wet feet, like I said, but it's a, it's a great plant and the hummingbirds just love it. Okay, brown-eyed Susan is a good one in the fall. These are all fall ones now. And it blooms late. It's, it is an annual, but it recedes readily and it gives you color in the fall. Whereas a lot of plants are dwindling and, and waning, this one is still growing and gives you color. And then um, there's the uh, metal blazing star. And I have a variety of blazing stars. Um, Prairie Blazing Star, Button Blazing Star, Meadow Blazing Star, and Prairie Blazing Star. But the meadow is the one that really attracts the uh, monarch butterflies. Not moving yet, but there you go. Yeah. Okay. So these are the two ones in the fall that really you're talking about a companion plant. So this New England aster, which provides the nectar for the uh, migrating butterflies, particularly monarchs. And then you can see on this 
showy goldenrod, all even look at the monarchs on it, and all the bees, bumblebees, all it's it's a it's one of my favorite plants, and that's the really the showy goldenrod. And then when you put them together, they're particularly special. Next. Okay, you want to quick start your pollen your garden. That's what you want to do is you want to buy plants and uh, I buy plants from two sources. Um, you want to um, you want to go to the Stone Silo Prairie Gardens in De Pere, Wisconsin. Uh, they have smaller plants. They're they're um, the cost is, is very competitive and uh, they have a tremendous variety of plants. I, I don't know of any source that has more variety of, of prairie plants and native plants and pollinator plants than and stone silo prairie gardens in De Pere. We have our own good place too, which is Door Landscape, right on 57 here in, in Door County, which is also excellent. There you can buy larger plants don't have quite the variety but they do very well and uh, so those are really two good sources when you and you that's the best way to start I would not uh, you can certainly start with seeds but it takes a very long but you want to use seeds to sustain your garden maybe to grow more plants and to give to others and to increase the size of your garden but you want to start your pollinator garden with buying the plants and putting them in. Okay, next. All right, we've gone over some of this, but why, why do you want to plant a garden? Because you want to help out the pollinators. They're declining because of pesticides and habitat loss. So you want to, you want to increase the and you want to help them out by planting these pollinator gardens. When you want to collect the seed now, this is the best time to collect your seed in late fall. And you want to do it by hand. You can take the seed, just taking the your hand, collecting the seed, and then you can put it in a uh, paper bag would be the best. I would discourage plastic bags because it can get too moist and you can have mildew. So if you're going to keep them, you want to put them in a paper bag and then put them in. If you can't plant them right away, which I would recommend, then you would put them in, in the refrigerator, keep them cool. Okay, next. Okay, here's easy to grow seeds for beginners. We got asters. Some of these plants I've gone over already. Asters, bee balm, black eyed Susan, columbine, golden rods. Some of your grasses, which are good to have in your pollinator garden, Indian grass. It's got a, it blooms. It's got a nice color. A uh, little blue stem turns nice color in the fall. Red. Your milkweeds, of course, to help out your monarchs and your butterflies. Parkridge pea and purple coneflower. Next. Okay, plant the seeds. And I do this in um, plastic, they're plastic uh, flats, or what did I say here, excuse me. So season plastic trays or flats. I use the trays and I put, make sure you put holes in the bottom for drainage. And the size of that is by 21 by 10, 10, 10, 10 and a half inches, 21 by 10 and a half. And you use a equal parts of coarse tube sand and potting soil. So you fill your tray up and then you plant your seeds on top. You don't make sure you don't want to plant them too deep. You just put your seeds on top and then just press them in there and not bury them. Just, just, and don't plant too deep. That's the main thing. And then water. And then water the, the, of course, the tray and then leave it out 
all winter long. Just put it someplace where it's sunny and not being um, adversely affected by weeds and other vegetation in a sunny spot. So that's how I do it. You can do it other ways. You can do it, uh, you can broadcast your seed in a weed-free environment at this time of the year. You can snow seed if you like. We talked a little bit about that when we were at, at Crossroads uh, collecting seeds. That can be done too. Um, and you can snow seed and then you can also call winter sowing, which is another way of of taking uh, milk jugs and and cutting them in half, and putting uh, soil, your same uh, coarse sand in your soil and planting your seed and leaving it out all, all winter. A little bit of a greenhouse effect there and that works quite well also. But what I do primarily is planting it in these plastic trays or flats and doing it this way, and I've been quite successful. Okay, next. Uh, okay, now in end of July and August, the first part you can transplant your, from these trays to pots. And you can see on the left, I usually do this on the back of my pickup, and I have my tray there, you can see, and then I have these three, three inch or four inch pots that I transplant my my seedlings into these pots. Next. Okay, I, as I mentioned, I find it convenient. It's convenient for me, I'm kind of tall, and so this works out but well for me. You have your, uh, uh, you can see your potting soil, your tube sand, your trays, your pots, and it, this kind of works out well for me here, the back of a Next. Okay, move plants to garden. Um, you want to do that. The timing there is um, you want to do this in September, and you're going to move your plants to the garden. Now you've taken them out of your, you've grown them in your your trays. Now you, if you and you've grown them in your pots. Now you're moving them out to your garden, and that usually is a, in about September. You need to give your pots a chance to grow before the first hard freeze. And then you wanna select a site, usually a sunny site that's weed free. And then you wanna prepare the site, making sure that it is in a sunny site, weed free and free of vegetation. Next. All right, just from moving plants, when you move your plants, you wanna make sure from you're moving them from your pots to your garden, check for root development, making sure that the roots have grown through the pot and like it, like the picture is showing there. And um, plants are ready when you can see the roots coming out on the sides. Be careful not to plant too deep. And uh, you want to soak immediately, in other words, water thoroughly. And then you want to freak, uh, water frequently during dry, dry periods. So that's probably your most important part there is to make sure that you're watering properly. If you're not, you uh, are subjecting your plants to stress and, and uh, probably not going to make it. So make sure you water. Next. Okay, so if you care for your plants and you you water, you weed, and then your plants will you should look something like this. They're gonna look healthy, robust, and ready for the the um, the winter season and stress us so they'll come back next. Next. All right, um, I have two, two favorite plants of mine that I really like. And um, one is the, uh, uh, the showy 
lady slipper, which I see in the springtime, it's on County Q. If you ever get a chance, it's on the Ridges Sanctuary. And that's a beautiful plant. And then the, the one in the fall that I like a lot is the, uh, the greater fringe gentian. And there's a lesser one we have up here. The, the greater is the one that grows a little further south in Illinois. And it's really a magnificent plant. In fact, uh, um, William Cullen Bryant, he was a poet and a very well-known American poet. And he was so impressed with this plant that he made a poem. And this poem is a great poem. And uh, it's uh, especially uh, fitting because of its spectacular look and uh, appeal. It goes like this, thou waitest late and comest alone when trees are bare and birds have flown and frosts and shortening nights portend. The aged year is near his end. Then doth thou sweet and quiet eye look through its fringes to the sky. Blue, blue, as if that sky let fall a flower from its cerulean wall. And uh, so I'll just leave you with that little poem. And if anybody has some questions, this is a question and answer period, I'd be glad to answer them. Are people unmuted, Morgan? Unmute themselves, or I can unmute people. I I put my question in the uh, question yeah. box. I'd like you like him to talk about um, the snow seeding and also putting seeds in the plastic containers because we were there on Saturday collecting seeds, but there were so many of us that I couldn't hear all of the um, the good information Don was giving everyone. Okay, so. Yeah, he wanted to know about. Um, he wanted to know a little bit about uh, the. Uh, yeah, collecting yeah. seed. Well, we collected the seeds. I, I'd like you to talk about the snow seeding. Oh yeah. And also, I thought I I heard I heard the tail end of something doing something in milk containers and poking oh, holes, yeah. in, but I didn't hear all of that. So. Okay. If could expand on that because I've got a ton of seeds from Saturday and I want I want to be able oh, yeah. to use them properly. Okay. So snow seeding is really taking your seed and then you you usually in late winter, early spring, when you still have snow on the ground, and you just broadcast the seed over the snow. And then as the snow percolates and melts down, it actually forces that seed in the ground. And it, so you have better penetration and germination at that time. So that's that's a good way of doing it. I I have not really done it myself, but I've heard there's a, a lot of good news I hear about it, and the efficacy of, of planting does very well. So um, that's one way. And okay. well, and then the other the other way is what they call winter sowing. And that is when you you take um, your seed and you plant, you open up a, 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 a milk jug and then you, um, you, you open up at the hinge and you use the duct tape and then you open it up and then you plant your soil medium in there, usually coarse sand, a half coarse sand and half uh, potting soil. And you plant okay. your seed and then you close the, the uh, the gallon jug back up and you seal it with the duct tape and you leave it out all winter long and then it germinates in the spring early because it acts like a greenhouse and then uh, you can uh, and then while other plants are being hardened off this is already hardened off so you're increasing the, the planting uh, cycle and you can you can directly plant those hardened off seeds into your garden hardened so off you plants where do you put this jug? You put it right outside, anywhere, in the, in, right out in the snow. 
Okay, but it has to be, it's okay in the snow? Sure, that's what it's designed for. You make sure that okay. you have holes in the right. gallon jug, of course, for water and and evaporation and so forth. But uh, yeah, that's basically what it is. It's called winter snow sewing. And you can look that up on wintersewing.com. You can okay. find out all about it. Okay, good. I will do that. Thank yes. you. Thanks, You're Jen. Welcome. You're welcome. John, there's a question about what plants to grow well in sandy areas. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. And um, you mentioned that if you're sowing them in the winter in jugs, that you'll have sandy soil mixed with um, potting soil. Yes. So does that mean a lot of these do grow in sandy soils? Well, you need something, a lot of, at least in my experience, in growing oh, uh, seeds in a plastic tray, you need a real friable open soil. Mm. So the sand, coarse sand and peat moss yeah, really know. help that out. So Oh, that's what that's what I use, and it, it usually works better for me when I have a, a good half mixture of quartz sand and then potting soil. Um, as far as uh, as far as plants that good do grow well in 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 sandy soil, certainly spotted bee balm, and I know that's a good one. Interesting to see it when he got down, but he probably yeah. just and I did have a a list here. <laughs> And I got it, but I don't. I don't think I have it real handy here. Anyway, here we go. Fan friendly natives. Okay, anise hyssop, um, dotted mint. Like I said, great loop, great blue lobelia is one. Harebell, um, bergamot grows well in in sandy soil. Hmm. Bergamot. And uh, so anyway, that's what I have for sand friendly natives. Thank you. Um, there, there's another question here. Is the mountain mint invasive like regular mint? And um, hmm. Liatris, is it Liatris you showed? Is this the same one that is being reported as an invasive plant that dries up, dries up wetlands? Yes, that's purple loose strife is the one that's the invasive one. And so that's the one you that does grow in uh, wet areas. And yeah, that's a an invasive. You don't want to want to stay away from that one. Um, it's loose strife? Yeah, purple loose strife. That's the that's the one that grows in swamps. You can see it around here, and that's the one you want to stay away from. Um but what the, uh, of course, the, the Liatris is a, a very uh, a great um, native plant, and it's a great pollinator plant, especially the, the uh, uh, meadow blazing star. So that they're not the same thing. Oh, they're not the same. No. no and what about not. the mountain mint? Is it in The mountain mint can be a little aggressive. I've had to, uh, yes, I've had to watch that one. I got, uh, there's... Um, I have mountain mint and I have to uh, keep it in check and I have to uh, reduce its clump size because it spreads by rhizomes. So you have to um, make sure that you keep it in check and, and keep it small. Otherwise it will, it will take over your garden. Yeah, that's your mountain mint. Okay, another question is when seedling when seeding plants in the tray now and leave and when you leave them outside, do you continue to keep them watered until the first snow? Well, usually you have enough. You can, can monitor your weather conditions. Generally, you don't have to, but if it's dry, it'd be a good idea to do it. Usually, uh, you don't have to worry too much this time of the year. Yeah, I would definitely moderate or. Uh, would definitely watch it closely to see if it does need water and then water accordingly. Okay. And then someone's raising a hand. Is it Elger? Yeah. Would you I like to ask me? a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, just uh, uh, would you repeat the name of that garden shop in Door County? I didn't catch it. Yeah. Uh, well, Door County, it's called Door Landscape and it's on 57. It's in Egg Harbor. 
and you go past Carlsville and it's on your left hand side. Go past Carlsville Road and it's called. Ron, I, I think it's on 42. Not I'm, did I say 50? I'm sorry, 42. You're right. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. A little brain brain freeze there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Right. That's a good place. There's uh, Karen Newburn works there. She's very helpful. There's another lady named Barb. And they really do know their plants. They're very helpful. And they do have a lot of native plants. They have the bigger ones, too. Thanks. Okay. It's a great, great place. Any other questions? Um, I have a little bit of a question. I understand there's a new, big project going on at Crossroads that you're helping with. Can you tell us something about that, Don? A big project at Crossroads. To restore native plants and remove the invasive species. I read something about it in the papers or online. Yeah, of course, I'm not, you know, I certainly know things about Crossroads. I know Coggin would know a lot more about that. But, you know, we were out at their, their meadow, and it's a great meadow. They have a lot of uh, uh, pollinate, or a lot of native plants and, and pollinator plants. We, we did a, a, a seed collection there on Saturday, so I certainly would uh, recommend anybody to go out there and take a look at their, their um their meadow and their uh, their native plant collections and their landscape, but uh, you know I know we we also collect seeds there. We, we encourage people to uh, not only collect them but then to to return them there and to um, collect the seeds and then go back out there and then plant them in different spots throughout the crossroads. I see. Um, I and I actually um, have another question. I I noticed since I come to the library every day, um, I noticed the columbine was ready to shed its seeds uh, fairly early. You can't wait till this time of the year. You have to get them when they're dropping on the ground. So I have a plastic bag here of which I shouldn't have. It should be paper. <laughs> oh, that's okay. But I have yeah. a plastic bag here of uh, columbine seeds, so I guess I should um, turn them over to Penny in the Door County Seed Library so people can start planting that's, them now, maybe. <laughs> that's so great. Out. That's great of you, Laura. Sure. And then you can keep them for a short period in the plastic bag. You just can't keep them there, you know, in, indefinitely. Yeah. Or, yeah, you could. But... Um, no, that's one plant. I, I, I certainly have a few growing around. I've never really collected the seed from those, so I don't know too much about it. They say they're, it's, um, it's they like native. to grow in the shade and they're great uh, uh, plants for uh, the nectar for hummingbirds in the early spring. So uh, yeah, good for you by collecting those seeds. Okay, well, does anyone else have a question? Um, someone is asking, is this slideshow available to come back and review for um, the flowers? And yes, this uh, slideshow will be put on YouTube and it's also on Facebook. So have a look at the library YouTube channel. It'll take a little while to get it um, online, but um, it will be there. We have quite a few um, programs here at the library and they're all put, many of them are put on our YouTube channel. To find the YouTube channel, there's a slider on our web, doorcountylibrary.org um, webpage, or at the very bottom in the lower right corner, there's a link to Facebook and um, YouTube, and um, is it Instagram, where you can see what the li what's going on at the library. And people are saying thank you. So let me add to that. Thank you, Don. I oh, you're welcome. Your knowledge and thank um, you, Laura. Yeah. Here. yeah, thanks for all your help. And I hope people will check out the Door County Seed Library. Also, we um, there is a website at doorcountyseedlibrary.org. Um, there were seeds handed out last spring, and there'll probably be some handed out again, even though we have this new situation with COVID. There were bags of seeds handed out last year. So um, keep your eyes open for more on that subject as we go on. Um, thanks. Thank you. I would just say if you're, uh, I don't know if I, maybe I mentioned it, but, uh, you know, we have this butterfly walk. It's usually end of August. And if you're 
everybody's certainly welcome to come and see my back garden if you want to see the pollinator garden and and and, and butterflies that would be great I just wanted it, to is that, that on the wild ones of door yeah that'll people? be on the wild ones yes it will it'll be on their wild ones uh uh of door yeah. of door peninsula facebook door peninsula it? facebook thank you yeah. yes okay that's, in august. that's in the end of august okay thank you thanks Thank you.